Okay, are we are we live? Um, it says attendees still on hold, so we can. We're not exactly. Um, Twelve people are on the attendee list. I can see that. Yeah. Hold on. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. We are live. Okay. Okay, we're going to be starting the presentation in just about three minutes, so uh, just be patient. Okay, uh, it is now 3.30 Eastern Time, 12.30 Pacific Time, and we're going to be starting today's webinar. My name is Batia Schwartz-Ahrens, and I am from the Wolfsdorf Immigration Law Group. I'm an immigration attorney in the New York office. We also have an office in Santa Monica, California, and we provide a wide range, wide range of immigration services. Today we're going to be speaking about a very specific type of work authorization visa categories in the United States. Um, these visa categories are going to focus on alternatives to the H-1B visa and more specifically options for foreign nationals um, from Canada, Mexico, Australia, Singapore, and Chile, or country-specific visa options which can be used as alternatives to the H-1B. During the presentation, if you have any questions, you can submit a question through the, um, the question option on your webinar control panel, or you can send me a chat. Um, additionally, if I did not answer your questions during the uh, webinar and you have something that comes up later, you can email me. My address is listed on this slide. It's b-e-h-r-e-n-s at wolfstorf.com. You can also call our firm, and the phone number is listed there as well. Okay, um, let's see. Just a second, I'm just trying to switch the slide. Okay, good. All right, um, today I'm going to be focusing, as I mentioned before, on a number of different type of work authorization visa categories. And in order to really understand the country-specific working visas, which is the focus of this presentation, we're going to have to go through a brief overview of some of the other visa categories. So today we're going to be speaking about the F-1 OPT, um, which is work authorization for students, the H-1B, which is the most popular type of employment-based 
work authorization in the United States that is available to foreign nationals with a bachelor's degree or higher degree. Um, and then we're going to speak specifically about the country-specific working visas that I mentioned before. Um, and we're going to conclude the webinar by going through the L1 visa, which is available to, to um, intra-company transferees, the O-1 visa, which is available to foreign nationals with extraordinary ability, and the J-1 visa, which is available to interns and trainees. Those last three categories and the first two, the F-1 and the H-1B, are all available to, as alternatives to the H-1B to any, um, for any qualifying foreign national from any country. Okay, so um, as a review of the country-specific working visas that we'll be covering, the Chilean and Singaporean country-specific working visa is called the H-1B1. Uh, it's very similar to the H-1B, but it's a, a number of visas that are designated specifically for nationals of Singapore and Chile pursuant to a treaty that the U.S. has. Um, the next two are the TN, which is available to Canadians and Mexicans as part of the NAFTA North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, and then we have the Australian E3. Uh, again, these are, these are all pursuant to treaties that the U.S. has. Um, and the final category of country-specific working visas is the E1 and E2, which are treaty trader and treaty investor visas available to foreign nationals who um, are citizens of countries that have treaty or trade or investment visa, uh, treaties, I'm sorry, excuse me, trade or, trade or investment treaties with the United States. Okay, so let's speak first about um, student, student status and work authorization as a student. The reason this is so important is because many foreign nationals come to the United States as a student and really begin their visa journey um, as, as a student and really kind of experience every different type of visa that um, throughout their journey. So as a student, um, it is possible to obtain work authorization. And there are two primary means of obtaining work authorization. One is called CPT and one is called OPT. CPT and OPT are not country specific, which means that any student who um, is qualified and any school which, school program which offers them um, can benefit from these classifications. CPT is cur curricular practical training. It is issued by the school. Um, the, it is employer specific, which means that the, the student must apply to the school and get approval through the school and that their I-20 or the form that's issued by the designated school official um, must reflect CPT authorization. Not all schools authorize CPT and um, but it really can be for part-time employment or full-time employment and internship. Um, that, that's, based, that's usually what it revolves around. Uh, CPT is uh, less common than OPT. OPT is available to almost every student who enrolls and completes a program, a, a degree program that's more than one year. It allows 12 months of unrestricted employment. Um, that employment can be as a contractor or as an employee. It can even be unpaid. Um, however, the student may not be unemployed for more than 90 days. So another important point is that any time spent in CPT takes away from time spent in OPT. So when planning out whether it's beneficial to, to use up CPT, um, the student really has to consider how long they want to stay in the U.S. and whether using up some of their work authorization during their school time when they're in F1 status actually is beneficial um, or hurts them in their long-term visa goals. There are a few ways to extend the 12-month OPT period. Uh, one way is through a STEM extension. Um, however, this is not so common. STEM extensions are available to 
graduates who have a science, technical, engineering, or math degree. And in order to benefit from this, the employer must be enrolled in E-Verify. E-Verify is currently a voluntary program, um, although in certain sectors and in certain states it is mandatory. Um, if an employer is not enrolled in E-Verify but is considering it just for the purposes of benefiting from these STEM extensions, they really have to think carefully and consider the benefits and, um, and the cons of doing so. And that's a little bit outside the scope of this presentation, so I won't go into that, but I just wanted to mention that. Um, let's see. Okay, so now that we've briefly touched on the F1 student status um, and the OPT work authorization, which follows graduation, we're going to talk about the next natural step in the progression of a student's life in the U.S. Uh, they need a job. So after that first year of OPT, uh, they start to they start to think about what they want, uh, how they're going to remain in the U.S., continue working, perhaps for their OPT employer. And the most common visa for students who are graduating with bachelor's degree is the H-1B professional occupation visa. This is a visa which is not country specific. And um, I'm going to go into detail about the background and requirements of the H-1B because it's really the foundation for several other visa categories, which we're going to discuss in more detail later. However, um, the point of this presentation is really to show you what to do when you can't use the H-1B. So in order to understand why you would need to um, turn to these alternatives, I want to explain a little bit about what the H-1B visa actually does. First of all, um, the H-1B visa is for professional occupations. This means that the position requires a bachelor's degree in a specific field and that the beneficiary or the employee actually possesses that at least that bachelor's degree in the designated field. You can see there's a few examples listed. Um, an accountant would have to have some kind of a related bachelor's degree, whether it's in finance, accounting, something like that. Um, if they had an art degree or an English degree, th that, that would not meet the requirements of the position. So it's, it's not only important that the position requires the degree, but also that the beneficiary possesses that, that specific one. A graphic designer who has a degree in graphic design, a bachelor's degree in graphic design, would qualify. In addition, um, an employee may, uh, the beneficiary may have a master's degree or a higher degree, but not a bachelor's degree in that specific field. And that is generally okay as well. H-1B visas are not country specific, which means that anyone in the world can apply for them as long as they meet the requirements. They can apply from within the United States or they can apply from outside of the United States in anticipation of a future job. However, the most challenging part, once it's determined that the beneficiary has met the qualifications, is when to apply for the H-1B visa. So um, every year, there are 65,000 H-1B visa numbers available. And the fiscal year, which is when the H-1B visa working time starts, is from October 1st to September 30th. It's possible to apply for the fiscal year six months prior to the actual start of the work date. So if you want to hire somebody to begin working October 1st, you can submit the H-1B petition um, six months prior, which is April 1st of that year. And um, every year that 65,000 visa numbers are reset. Uh, just to, to be clear, um, well, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about the cap uh, in the next slide. But in addition to the 65,000 visas, visa numbers per year, there are 20,000 for U.S. graduates with master's degree or higher. So um, if you have a master's degree, you, you would apply a master's degree from the United States. You would actually apply for the, for the H-1B through the cap. However, you would be 
um, your visa number would be taken from that additional 20,000. And um, within that 65,000 for everybody else, whether their degree is from the U.S. or from abroad, there are a certain number that are reserved for just for Singaporeans and Chileans, subject to a treaty that we have, that the U.S. has with Chile and Singapore. So you can see that there's 5,400 5, reserved for Singapore and 1,400 reserved for Chile. Every year, the H-1B cap is met. Sometimes it's met earlier, sometimes it's met later. Um, usually the master's degree cap is actually met prior to the bachelor's degree cap, um, but it's very rare. In fact, I don't ever think I've heard of the Singaporean and Chilean caps being met. So that's one of the reasons that we're going to focus on some of those country-specific options in a little bit. <clears throat> Okay, once the um, cap is met, which means once all 65,000 bachelor's degree um, and 20,000 master's degree um, visa numbers are given out, there are no more visa numbers for that fiscal year and the petitioner, which is the employer, will have to wait until the following fiscal year in order to apply for the next batch of 65,000 plus 20,000 H-1Bs. So if all, for example, this year, um, the, the H-1B cap for the fiscal year of 2012, which begins October 1st, 2012, and concludes September 30th, 2012, was reached on November 22nd, 2011. That means that from now until April 1st, there are no more visa numbers available for the fiscal year of 2012, and anybody applying for an H-1B visa will have to use an alternative. Um, however, there are some cap-exempt organizations, and what this means is that the employer is not subject to the cap and can apply for the H-1B visa for their employee at any time. Institutes of higher education, like universities and colleges, nonprofit organizations associated with the Institute of Higher Education, um, and some nonprofit research and government research organizations are all part of this. It's limited pretty much to those types of employers. And um, if, if your company or your organization is one of those, you probably know about this or have heard about this. And you're, uh, you're, you know, that's, a, that's a great advantage as far as employing employing any foreign nationals. However, um, if the employee qualifies and receives an H-1B under the CAP exemption, transferring to a non-CAP exempt employer can be challenging if it's not timed right. So just because the individual received an H-1B uh, visa number, or through a cap exempt organization does not mean that they are never again subject to the cap. Okay, some of the details which I'm going to skim through are the fees. Um, there are significant government filing fees for the H-1B. If the there are fee exemptions as well, and those fee exemptions apply in a similar way as the cap exemptions. Um, like institutions of higher education and those types of um, employers. But in general, most employees who are filing an initial H-1B petition or a first extension must pay a training fee. This training fee is either $1,500 for employers with 26 or more employees or $750 for employees with 25 or fewer employees. After the first extension, um, at the time of the second extension, the employer is no longer required to pay that. The fraud fee of $500 is required for all new H-1Bs and change of employer petitions, but is not required for extensions. And even cap-exempt organizations and fee-exempt organizations must pay the fraud fee. These fees are used to um, in investigate uh, companies to make sure that there are no, um, you know, to, to make site visits actually to companies to, to make sure that the company and the employment is not fraudulent. 
in addition to the training fee and the fraud fee, every petition, whether it's fee exempt or not fee exempt, an extension or an initial, a change of employer, every fee requires the, fi the filing fee for the H-1B, which is $325 and $290 for any derivative spouse or children. Um, there's only one fee that's paid for the derivative, so if there's three children and one spouse, it's still $290. Premium processing is available, which means that the petition can be adjudicated within 15 days. However, um, just to understand what that means, first of all, adjudication um, may mean approval within 15 days. It may mean an RFE issued within 15 days, which is a request for additional evidence. And then once the response to that request for additional evidence is submitted, um, that will again be adjudicated within another 15 days. So that's one thing to note about premium processing. The other thing to note about premium processing is that if you are applying for an H-1B well in advance of the, the working fiscal year, so if you're applying April 1st, 2012 for the following fiscal year, which will begin October 1st, 2012, even if your petition is approved by October 15, 2012, the, the first start date that the employee will be able to begin their employment is still October 1, 2012. So premium processing doesn't really have much benefit except for to expedite the processing and the adjudication and give you the peace of mind of knowing that your petition has been approved. So who is responsible for all these fees? Well, this is an important issue. The employer is actually responsible for the training fee. Um, the employee may pay, it's, it's, there's a little bit of a gray area on whether the employee can pay any of the other fees. Um, however, we always recommend that the employer pay all the government filing fees so that there are no questions about who paid what, and there are no, no questions of any type of violation. In addition to that, um, there is an issue with the, uh, the legal fees. In general, the beneficiary or the employee may pay the legal fees. However, if paying the legal fees would bring the beneficiary's salary below the prevailing wage, which is the wage set out by the Department of Labor um, as the minimum for that position in that area, then the employer must also cover the legal fees because the H-1B visa petition is really considered to be an expense and responsibility of the employer. Um, in, in many cases, it's not necessary for the employer to cover that legal fee, but many employers do. And again, it's when there's no, there's no question um, of any type of violation in that case. Okay, um, so just a couple notes about the H-1B professional occupation visas. Um, they are employer specific, unlike OPT, which allows you to bounce from employer to employer during your year of work, unbridled work authorization. H-1B visas are only um, allow, H-1B employees are only allowed to work for that employer, and the employer can't substitute in a different H-1B employee if, if the beneficiary leaves. So um, if the beneficiary leaves, they need to apply to, they need to have another petitioner um, submit an H-1B petition to transfer their status to work for that second company. They can work part-time or full-time, um, which means that um, even if an H-1B beneficiary is only working 20 hours a week, that's not a problem at all. There's no um, minimum. And I've, I've actually seen part-time H-1Bs for as low as 5 or 10 hours a week, which is not common, but I have seen it. Um, at that said, many um, of these part-time employees are working for multiple employers. And the way to do that is to file several um, concurrent H-1Bs. So a person is working 15 hours for company A and 15 hours for company B, and that's no problem as long as there's two approved H-1B H um, status petitions. Uh, there is a six-year maximum 
for an H-1B visa holder, they can only work for up to six years, and each time you apply for an extension, you only get three years at a time. So you can work for one employer for three years, and then you can extend for another three years, and then you hit your limit. Or you can work for one employer for two years, and then switch to a new employer, get three years, and then you'll have one year left to extend. There are ways to extend beyond that six year, which we'll go into in a little bit, but that really um, relates to whether or not you have a green card petition filed for the beneficiary prior to their, um, their fifth year in H-1B status. So I, it's a kind of a complicated discussion that's, again, outside the scope of this presentation, but if you have a green card pending for you, and it's been pending for more than 365 days, you can extend beyond that six year indefinitely until you get your green card. So that way you don't lose out on any job opportunities because of this six year maximum. H-1B employment is at will, which means that the employee may leave at any time and the employer may terminate employment at any, any time. The only um, sort of contractual relationship or con contractual um, detail is that while the beneficiary is working for the employer, the employer must pay the employee the amount stated in the petition and um, for the amount of hours stated. If they work more than that, they have to be paid more than that. They may not work under the hours stated or um, for less money than what was agreed on. So the basic process uh, for the H-1B visa is through the USCIS to submit the application to the USCIS, which includes a support letter with a job description, USCIS forms, and those fees. Generally takes about two to five months, and you can upgrade that to premium processing by paying an additional $1,225 and uh, that will result in adjudication within 15 days, which leads to approvals or an RFP, as I explained before. So let's talk about the timing of an H-1B, and, and this is really the reason why we're here. As I mentioned before, um, we have this April 1st, October 1st issue. So every April 1st, lots and lots of people get their H-1B petitions submitted to USCIS so they can be counted for the cap that begins six months later in October. If you look at the trends from 2008 to 2012, you'll notice that it really goes um, kind of on the same pace as the general um, unemployment rate and the, the general economic trends. So in 2008, it was a, you know, things were a little stronger and um, there were many more foreign nationals filling jobs. There are many more jobs available. And that cap was reached on the same day that it was open. So April 1st, 65,000. Actually, I think it was something like 135,000 petitions were delivered to USCIS. And USCIS, USCIS actually had to do a lottery and choose six, randomly 65,000 um, visa petitions. You can see that in 2009, the cap was reached April 7th. Um, in 2010, things were a little bit slower. The cap wasn't reached until December 21st, 2009. What that meant was that as of October 1st, which was the start date, October 1st, 2009 was that start date um, of the fiscal year for 2010, there were still visa numbers available. From, so from October 1st to December 21st, people could submit their H-1B visa petitions and start working 15 days later if they did it via premium processing and have no delay time. <clears throat> and you can see that this year um, the cap was reached November 22nd, 2011, which means that anybody applying for an H-1B will have to wait until April 1st, 2012 um, in order to submit a petition and won't be able to begin working October 1st, 2012. So this presentation is about what to do, how to get your employee, or how to get work authorization for yourself between now and uh, um, 
October 1st, 2012. Okay, couple new rules for, a, for F1s that we were talking about before. Um, first of all, I, I said that there was a STEM cell, ex, um, excuse me, a STEM science, technology, engineering, or math extension available to um, F1 OPT students who, whose employers were enrolled in E-Verify. There's another type of extension available for F1s who are um, currently on their OPT. There's something called a cap gap. And what that means is in the past, every June, there would be a number of a class of students graduating. They would um, start their OPT, work for a year, and then they would end their OPT year in June, July, August, something like that. However, their H-1B in period wouldn't begin until October 1st. So there was a gap between the end of their OPT and the beginning of their H-1B. So from about June, July, August, of that year till October of that year. What this new rule did was that it allowed any OPT student to have an automatic extension of their OPT status until the start of their, um, their H-1B period or until the approval or denial of their H-1B petition. So if the petition is denied, they have no more work authorization and must leave the country. Um, if the petition is approved, their, their OPT is extended until October 1st when they automatically shift into H-1B status, or if it's submitted at, and, it, and, it's, and the adjudication process takes longer, it continues to pend um, until that October 1st start date. Okay. This is a little diagram of what I just explained to you. A student graduates in June 2011. Their OPT starts in July 2011. You file the H-1B in April 2012 while they're still on their year of OPT. The OPT ends in July 2012. And then the cap gap period begins until October 1, 2012, when their H-1B period begins. So um, as long as they're selected for the H-1B and their petition, uh, like in the case where USCIS does a lottery, if their petition is, is not selected, uh, they don't benefit from that cap gap relief, and they do need to either go home or find some other visa status. And uh, generally, the, the period following the OPT is about 60 days. There's a 60-day grace period. So they have 60 days to pack up and or figure out what the next option is. Okay, um, H-1B portability is a very unique benefit of the H-1B visa. What this means is that if you are working for an H-1B employer um, on an approved petition and you want to change employers, you can actually submit a petition with a new employer to transfer and you don't need to wait until that petition is adjudicated because you're not seeking a new type of status, you're just seeking a transfer of your currently approved status for a similar type of position with a different employer. You do still need to submit the petition and it does need to be approved, but it does not need to be approved prior to beginning your employment. This is beneficial to foreign nationals because it means that they can transfer relatively quickly, they're not subject to the cap again, and they don't need to pay premium processing fees. Um, on this slide it says unless travel issues. There are some cases where uh, you may prefer to submit premium processing, but portability also allows foreign nationals to travel to, uh, as long as their visa in their passport is still valid, even if it indicates that it's with a different employer, they can travel um, showing that they have an H-1B visa transfer pending and a valid visa to re-enter the U.S. Okay, as I mentioned before, there is an issue for um, portability for employees who are employed by a cap-exempt 
employer, such as a hospital, um, moving to a CAP subject employer, such as a, um, you know, a private technology company, because they were never counted for the CAP since they were CAP exempt before. Okay. I'm going to zip through this slide because I want to make sure that we have enough time for, um, for the rest of the presentation. Okay. Okay, so what happens um, when you reach that six-year cap? And is six years really six years? Um, in, it's, as I explained before, that it is possible to extend your H-1B visa beyond the six years um, by starting the green card process. Um, you can also recapture any time st spent abroad, because time spent abroad or in a different visa stat category is not time spent in H-1B and does not count. So if you're on your fifth year and every year you go to India for a month, you can count up that six months and you can add that on to the end of your requested stay. And now in, at your next H-1B extension, you can ask for a year and a half rather than um, than just a year. So there are a couple ways and uh, this can really become a strategic issue when applying for a green card and planning out that timeline uh, comes into play. H4 spouses and children um, don't have work authorization but they may go to school um, and an H4 spouse may work as long as they switch their visa status. So if they're in H4, they can apply for their own H1B, or they can apply for um, their own anything else they may qualify for. Um, they don't need to be on the same category as their spouse. Okay, so that brings us to what I really wanted to talk about, which is the H1B1 Chilean and Singaporean visas. Um, these are beneficial, as I said before, because right now and at other times in the fiscal year, there's not going to be any H-1B visas available. So under this H-1B1 Chilean and Singaporean um, treaty, uh, which was part of a free trade agreement between the U.S. and these two countries in 2004, 5,400 visas were set aside each year for Singaporeans and 1,400 for Chileans. Um, the requirements are very similar to the H-1B requirements in that it has to be a specialty occupation. The position, for the most part, must, um, must require a bachelor's degree in a specific area. And um, of, obviously, the foreign national must be a citizen of Singapore and Chile. Um, however, the spouse or derivative children who are going to be applying for an H-4 do not have to be a citizen of Singapore in order to get the H-4. Um, the rules for the H-4 are the same. The, the spouses still cannot work, and they go to school, and they switch into other statuses. One um, unknown, not so commonly known benefit of the H-1B1 is that there are a few uh, job positions that actually don't require a degree, um, meaning a bachelor's degree. And those are listed here. Chilean uh, agricultural managers or physical therapists don't require a degree. However, a physical therapist will probably uh, still require licensing. Um, and disaster relief claims adjusters or management consultants for both Singaporeans and Chileans also don't require a bachelor's degree. Okay, one of the main benefits of the H-1B1 and, and also one of the main differences between the H-1B and the H-1B1 are that the employee may apply directly at the U.S. consulate and does not need to submit any type of petition to USCIS. As I explained before when discussing the H-1B, um, the employer must submit forms, a letter, in a labor condition application, um, and fees and uh, documentation to USCIS 
USCIS adjudicates the petition and then issues an approval. Um, once the beneficiary has that approval, if they applied from within the United States as a change of status from another type of status, they um, automatically start working. However, if they leave the country, they won't be able to re-enter the country until they go to the consulate abroad, apply for a visa, which is when they present their approval notice and possibly their documentation and have an interview with an officer at, from the State Department, um, get their visa, and re-enter the country as an H-1B visa holder. Um, the difference with H-1B1s is that the Singaporean or Chilean national may go directly to the consulate. Uh, they don't need to submit any of that documentation to USCIS. This saves a lot of time. Um, they don't need to wait you know, two to five months for adjudication. They don't need to pay premium processing fees to speed things up 15 to 15 days. Um, they actually don't need to pay any type of um, fees because there's, there are no, there's no USCIS fees that, um, that are taken at the consulate for, these, for this visa category. They will have to pay a visa application fee, which changes depending on the visa category and the consulate. But it's usually um, about $150. And in some cases, it's 390. So um, again, it, it's just a really speedy way. They just need to make an appointment with the consulate, show their documentation. They do need to provide an LCA, which is, again, um, in, it's actually through the Department of Labor. It's an application that um, states that the employer will pay the prevailing wage and will comply with a few other um, requirements such as posting notice of the position for 10 days on the work site and, um, and, the, and a few other. Um, there, there's four different agreements that the, the attestations that the employer makes. Um, it is possible to extend the H-1B one in the U.S. Um, or do a change of status in the U.S. However, if you do that, you do need to pay all the same, um, the, the filing fee and the, the training fee as you would for the H-1B. The ma major benefit is that these H-1B1s are always available after the H-1B cap is met because it's a separate pool. Um, and one other benefit is that there is no life licensure as a prerequisite to entering, so sometimes people have to wait abroad for their license but can't get their license until they begin work, get their approval, so it's kind of like a chicken and an egg situation. This category is, um, actually allows people to avoid that issue. And the most, oops, the most important, um, or to me, what, what I think is quite significant is that there's no six-year time limit. So in, an H-1B1 can stay on it for seven years, ten years without starting an H-1, without a starting a green card process. That said, there are some limitations. First of all, um, an 18-month visa is issued at the consulate, whereas an H-1B visa holder gets a three-year validity date. So the H-1B-1 needs to be renewed much more often. There's no dual intent. Um, this means that every time you go for your H-1B-1 interview, you're going to have to show that you have strong ties to your home country, that you have no intentions to immigrate to the United States, and, and that um, you, and, and then when you're in the United States, you're not going to be able to, it's going to be very difficult or if not impossible, to actually um, come and go and pursue a green card while on an H-1B1. So usually H-1B1s start out um, in that status, and then when they're getting ready to, to uh, pursue a green card, they switch to an H-1B, which is a cap subject category. Um, there is no portability, so unlike the H-1Bs, they can't just move to a new employer and file the petition and the next day start. The other limitation is that H-1B1 premium processing is really sticky. 
um, in general, it's not permitted. However, there are some cases where premium processing was accepted and the petition was adjudicated within 15 days. So it's not consistent. I definitely wouldn't recommend it or depend on it just because it's so inconsistent. And just like many things with USCIS, you need to um, take the extra cautious route because there, there, is no, um, there is no specific allowance for premium processing for H-1B1 petitions, which means that you could be waiting for two to five months for your petition to be adjudicated. However, you always have the option of going abroad to the consulate to apply for the H-1B1 there. And again, without portability, um, you can't work or travel while the petition is pending. All right, moving on to the Canadian and Mexican um, visas under the TN-NAFTA um, treaty. Okay, um, so the most limiting um, part of the TN visa is that the job must be on the list of occupations um, that's designated under NAFTA. So let me just see if I have any of those listed. I do. Um, you can see here that this is a sampling. There's probably about 70, maybe even 100 different professionals, but they're very specific, such as accountant, um, physician, uh, but it has to be a teaching or research position, physical therapist, university teacher, high school teacher doesn't count, dentist, engineer. Those are a sampling of the different types of professionals. Um, if your profession is not listed on this list, you're out of luck. Um, so that list is available, and I, I made a tiny URL. You can copy that down, or you can just um, you can also just Google it, and you, you'll find it if you do NAFTA list of professionals. Um, Canadians may apply at the border, uh, which means they can just show their documentation, show their employment letter um, and their credentials. And once they present that to the Border Patrol officer, they will be issued a three-year visa. Um, and they can enter and leave freely using this three-year. Um, actually, they're, they're issued an I-94 card. Um, and they can enter and re-enter, enter and exit, enter and exit within the three years. Um, they can also apply for a visa at the consulate, but it's not necessary because they can just apply at the border. Mexican, the situation for Mexicans is a little bit differently. They actually must apply at the U.S. Embassy in Mexico, and they're only given a one-year visa. So there is no border entries for Mexicans with TNs, but the documentation that they must supply is, um, is identical. Similar to the H-1B1, there is no immigrant intent. There's no dual intent. Um, and these two visa categories are all in contrast to the H-1B, which has dual intent, allowing the foreign national to pursue their green card at the same time as being on their H-1B. That's one of the most um, attractive factors about that H-1B and why everybody wants one. But in the meantime, when the cap is met, these are good alternatives. OK, um, so the TN, like the um, H-1B1 for Singaporeans and Chileans, has unlimited extensions and readmissions. Um, however, if a person is going back and forth for 10 years or 15 years, at some point an officer is going to probably question them about their non-immigrant intent. If you've been in the US for 20 years working on this TN, how can you say that you're not a you have no immigrant, immigrant intent. How can you say that you don't want to live permanently in the United States? Um, that's not really in a, a means for a, a denial, but um, it is, there's a lot of discretion given to the Border Patrol officers. So um, it's something to keep in mind. And if you do plan on renewing for a long time, you might want to consider some other uh, visa, like the H-1B. Um, pursue a green card. Um, 
The other benefit is that no I-129 or LCA is needed for Mexicans or Canadians. So the process can be very quick and very inexpensive. Um, you just go to, for a Canadian, they can just go to the border, um, present their papers. I think there's a $50 fee. They come in that same day, everything is fine. There's no waiting period while it's adjudicated. There's no premium processing fees. Um, there's no waiting time for an LCA to be certified. So it's a rather quick process if the person leaves the United States. If they do it from within the United States as a change of status or an extension, um, you do have to go through that more time-consuming process of applying to USCIS for an extension by submitting the, the documentation. Uh, the fees are only $325. However, it will take, take anywhere from two to five months to adjudicate. So if you want it sped up, you must pay that premium processing fee, which ups it $1,225, $1,225. Um, it, it's often much quicker and easier for that foreign national to go to the border. Um, and in the case of a Mexican, for them to go to, um, to their consulate and apply for a new visa. Um, as I mentioned before, Canadians don't need visas, but Mexicans do. You can apply directly at the consulate or the port of entry. Um, the position may be part-time or full-time. Again, if it is part-time and it's for too few hours, um, you, you may be questioned by the Border Patrol officer, you know, how are you going to support yourself for, when you're only working for five hours a week? Um, there is no minimum wage set out, but other than the federal minimum or state minimum wages. There's no um, Department of Labor prevailing wage determination requirement for, um, for these positions. So that gives a lot more flexibility than the H-1B, which actually requires that the individual um, is paid the prevailing wage for the position. And the H-1B-1 for Singaporeans also requires that. Spouses and children receive the TD visa, which does not allow work authorization. Um, the timing, as I said, it's anywhere from two to five months if it's done from within the United States. If it's done uh, through a port of entry or through the consulate, what, however long the consulate will take or the, the port of entry. So that, that's usually pretty quickly for a port of entry and the consulate could take a couple days longer, but it's nothing, it's not months. Um, premium processing is available, as I mentioned before, and often necessary. Um, there is no portability. Um, so if you're switching to a new employer, you do need to do premium processing in order to get that work authorization and begin your employment. Those USCIS fees I just went over, but as a refresher, um, you would have to pay that $325 plus $1225 for premium processing if you wanted an adjudication within 15 days versus the consular fees, which are usually about $150 or $50 at the um, port of entry. Um, one other benefit is that a three-year Canadian degree is accepted and no evaluation is required for any type of position that requires a degree. Um, so most degrees in Canada are three years, and that can be an issue for H-1B petitions, which require the equivalent of a US four-year degree. So a Canadian would have to um, apply for a degree evaluation and, and show that they have the equivalent of a four-year degree. But for a TN visa, they don't. Okay, there are some limitations. Um, TDs, or, or the, benef this, the derivative beneficiaries, don't have work authorization. There's no um, dual intent. Uh, Mexican or Canadians must meet the qualifications of the profession. You must be on that NAFTA list. Um, there's no self-employment, so there must be a petitioner. But this is a requirement of all the visa categories we've covered so far. And one more note, uh, management consultants, which often seems like a catch-all, um, is a highly scrutinized category. So if that's something that you're considering because it doesn't, it's, it doesn't require um, a bachelor's degree and it sort of seems to encompass a lot of different um, areas, consult with an attorney carefully before you go in that direction. It can be done, but it must be done properly.
Okay, moving on to the E3s, the Australian um, visas. Okay, there are, this is also for specialty occupations, um, which means that the, the position requires a bachelor's degree in a specific area. There are about 10,500 of these issued per year. Um, they are issued in two-year increments and indefinitely renewable. There are uh, different types of fees. The fee structure is similar to the TN. They can either go to the consulate and apply directly. Um, the visa fee is $390. Or they can apply for the E3 in the United States, which is a $325 um, USCIS fee. But there is no premium processing. So adjudication of that E3 could take anywhere from two to five months. And during that time, the beneficiary cannot work and must leave. So usually, I advise E3s to go to the consulate. A lot of people, uh, you can go to Australia, but some people go to the Bahamas. And there are some other options. Um, as I mentioned, it's indefinitely renewable. So there is no six-year time limit. Um, there also is no portability. Um, and um, the one in significant benefit is that spouses and children receive E3 derivative visas, which means that they, spouses can apply for work authorization. And they can work for anyone. They have the widest range. It's very similar to that OPT work authorization. Um, it's valid for the period of the E3's, the primary E3's employment, and, uh, but usually in one-year increments. Um, and they can work for anyone. So it's, it's a big benefit for Australians. These visas also, there are so many visa numbers, they're never used up. Some of the limitations of the Australian E3 are that um, the for, in order to change an employer, um, the employer must file a new LCA and a new E3 application. Uh, so that means that there is no portability. The employee can't just start working the next day. They have to either go out to Australia or Bahamas or some other consular post, get their visa and re-enter, or they have to apply and then just wait, and they can't start their work. There's no dual intent, so they cannot pursue an immigrant you know, visa or a green card. Um, and there's no, port, there's no premium processing. Okay. <clears throat> the um, next and final country-specific visa category is the E1, E2 treaty visas. Um, there must be a treaty between the US and the treaty country. These are all, all the treaty countries are also listed um, through the Department of State. And at least 50% of the company must be owned by the treaty country. Okay, a treaty um, trader says that 50% of the trade must be between the treaty country and the US. For a E2 investor visa, the investor must be the, a foreign national who is a citizen of a country that's part of this trade, trade um, investor treaty. And they must make the substantial investment. You can start up a company or even acquire a company as an E1 or an E2. Um, and the foreign national must be the national of the treaty con country. So for example, if um, there is a British national who's, who is starting a con company and they're investing a significant amount of money um, under the E2 investor visa, they can do this. But um, if it's a foreign national from a country that is not part of the um, the uh, the tr these treaties that's doing more than fifty percent of the investment, then the um, it, the visa the person won't qualify for the um, category. Um, additionally, just one more thing: you can bring over employees. Um, of employees under, once the E2 co company is established, as long as the 
employee is an executive manager or a central employee, they can work, but they must have the nationality of the treaty country. Oh, here's a, here's a good example. So the company is in the US, it's a 50% Australian owned company. They can hire an Australian executive manager or a central employee under the e-visa. The spouses and children receive that E2, and just like the E3, um, for Australians, the spouse can apply for a work permit, and they do benefit from unrestricted employment. Okay, so that concludes the um, country-specific visa options. Now I'm going to talk about a few more. We have a couple more minutes, and I'm going to skim through a few more of the um, non-immigrant visa options, which can be used as an alternative to the H-1B once the cap has, met, has been met. So the first one is the L-1A multinational executive or manager visa, or L-1B trans, intercompany transferee for someone with specialized knowledge. So the L-1s are really designed to um, help a company that's established abroad send foreign nationals to work for a company that's established in the U.S. and to, uh, to help manage that, co that U.S. entity or to provide some kind of specialized knowledge to that U.S. entity. The, requ the requirements are that the individual being transferred, the foreign national, has spent at least one year abroad in the last three years prior to entering the United States at the parent affiliate or subsidiary in the foreign country um, in an executive managerial or specialized knowledge position. So if, uh, if somebody is if there's a company that's uh, located in Japan and that company has an affiliate that's owned that's in the United States and they want to send over one of their um, top executives to get the U.S. entity moving, um, as long as that executive has been employed by the Japanese entity for at least one year in the past three years, they can transfer them to the U.S. entity as an L1A multinational executive. Um, similarly, the L1B has that same one year in the past three year requirements, but the, the definition of specialized knowledge is slightly different, um, and this also falls outside of the scope of this webinar, uh, but it's basically somebody who controls some kind of, some kind of Function. It's usually a technical type of position where they know some kind of software that the company uses, something like that, something very specific um, that requires some kind of, per, some individual that has to be trained or have experience, specific experience at the foreign entity that nobody has in the U.S. And they must be coming to the, sorry, one second, let's go back. Oh, they must be coming to the U.S. to fill that executive managerial or specialized knowledge position. The L1A, which is for the executive or manager, um, is entitled to up to seven years, and the L1B is for the specialized knowledge is entitled to up to five years. So there's a limit, um, just like the H1B, which has six years. And uh, just as a side note, that five-year period does count against H1B time. So if an individual is in L1B status for five years and then they want to switch to H1B status, they only have one year possible of H1B status unless a green card process is started very early on. Similarly, if they've used up seven years of L1A time, um, they may not transfer to an H1B unless in some way there was a green card process started. Um, there is a very specific fast track type of green card that's available to L1A visa holders as long as they meet certain conditions um, that they were working for the company abroad in an executive or manager. But relatively quickly, avoiding some of the long delays. Okay. Um, spouses and children receive L2 visas, which entitles them to um, work, just like the E3s, which is a big benefit. Okay. 
Uh, just a couple more slides. I know we're wrapping up, and I, I definitely want to give you the chance to ask any questions. Um, one, uh, another type of um, visa category that's available to many is the O-1 um, for aliens of extraordinary ability. Uh, this can be aliens of extraordinary ability in the arts, motion pictures, TV, all, or in science, athletic, or business. Um, there are different standards, and the O-1 extraordinary ability in the arts has um, a lower standard in gen than in the sciences, athletics, or business. In general, extraordinary um, means that extraordinary ability for um, artists is still in recognition, significantly above that ordinarily encountered. And we'll compare this with the standard for um, business people or sciences, which is one of the small percentage who, has, who have risen to the top of their field of endeavor. So there's a, a much narrower definition, and it's a much more competitive um, designation if the person is not qualifying as an artist. Um, if they are qualifying as an artist or in any type of category, they do need to show evidence of their extraordinary ability, which is often in the form of awards, publicity, newspaper articles, um, high ticket sales, or um, lots of publications, judging the work of others, things like that. Um, and, and in general, um, the individual needs to meet three out of 10 of the criteria. Um, in the case of a scientist or a business person, awards are very important. Published if the individual is coming to the US and as an um, extraordinary graphic designer, um, they need to show not only that they've won different types of awards for projects and um, that their work has been published or exhibited, but also that they've been recognized, perhaps in a trade journal um, or by um, in the newspaper for, for their designs or something like that. Um, so those are the types of evidence. Okay. Um, the O-1 visa has some benefits. Uh, particularly that it also is renewable indefinitely. So somebody who is reaching their six-year H-1B maximum may consider an O-1. Um, it also can be used when the H-1B quota is met. Um, and it also, uh, J-1 individuals who are subject to the two-year home residency requirement can still be employed on the O-1 visa. So it is an option for people who would otherwise have to return home. Um, O3 spouses and children can attend school, but they cannot work. And there is another category for essential support, um, meaning uh, the support staff of, let's say, a motion picture um, or a TV program, something like that, that's coming to the U.S. and they need some specific type of camera person. Uh, so the, that's, I don't think that is really so applicable um, to, to the interests of our attendees. So I'm not going to go into that in detail, but here's some information. Um, and I'm happy to answer follow-ups about that. And then um, as our final uh, category as an option for um, an alternative to the H-1B cap, we have the J-1 interns and trainees. Um, interns are generally given a J-1 visa for 12 months. Trainees are def generally given an 18-month. Um, however, some programs, some trainee programs, do not give an 18-month program. The most unique part about the J-1 visa is that it's actually administered by the Department of State. So, um, so what happens is that the um, individual will go and apply at the consulate um, for, for their J-1 visa, um, and they will, be, uh, they, they will be expected to show that they do not have intent, dual intent, uh, meaning that they have strong ties to their home country, they don't intend to immigrate, and that they intend to 
fulfill the purpose of their visa to train in the U.S. and then to return to their home country enriched by what they've learned in the U.S. Um, it can be challenging in some consular posts and um, in some circumstances, but it still is a, um, a, a valid and possible option for somebody who has, does not have any other options because of the H-1B cap. Um, one important distinction between training under the, trainee, the J-1 trainee program is that the trainee is not permitted to be engaged in actual employment. The position is really a training position. It's an opportunity to learn about management or something else um, in the U.S. And they cannot be involved in any type of gainful employment. In order to qualify for a trainee program, they must have a degree or professional certificate from a foreign post-secondary institution. So somebody who has a bachelor's degree from the U.S. wouldn't qualify. Um, and they have to have at least one year work experience in the field. Um, or they must have five years of work experience outside the U.S. in the field of the training program. The training program must be structured and guided, and there must be an individual um, at the company, at the, the sponsor company, who is going to lead them through that training program. Um, in contrast, the intern um, program is, for, is only for 12 months. It's for um, students who are currently enrolled at a degree or certificate um, uh, institution outside of the U.S. or who graduated from a foreign institution less than a year ago. And this is also a structured and guided internship program in the field of study. So uh, I, that concludes our general overview of some of the country-specific visa options, um, which again were those H-1B1s, TNs, E3s, E1s, and E2s, as well as some of the alternatives to the H-1B cap, like the L1, the O1, and the J1. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, so if you have any, please enter them in the question bank <coughs> or just send a chat, and I'm happy to answer it. And if not, feel free to send me an email. Again, my um, my email address is behrens at wolfsdorf.com. I also want to remind you that this is part of the series of Wolfsdorf Immigration Law Group presentations that we regularly prepare and present for free um, through our webinars. Um, there, was, there have been several this year, and uh, next week on January 17th, Mr. Wolfsdorf, Mr. Bernie Wolfsdorf, the principal partner at our firm will be presenting an EB-5 uh, panel with presenting three experts, um, Michael Gibson, Jora Law, a securities attorney, and uh, Bernie Wolfstorff, who um, is a leader in the field of EB-5s, and they will be presenting about that topic. Following uh, that presentation on February 9th, we will be having a presentation on religious worker visas for ordained and non-ordained religious workers. So we have a lot in store, and we encourage you to take advantage of our webinars um, and sign up. So if there are any questions, please submit your questions now. And again, um, if not, I'll be happy to take questions um, following up at any point. Okay, I don't see any questions, and it is 4.41 Eastern Standard Time, so I think we'll wait a couple more minutes, and uh, if there are no questions, we can end this session. Thank you for joining me um, for today's presentation. I hope this was beneficial, and uh, look forward to having you participate with us on our future webinars.